Welcome to worship at Mount Calvary. We're glad you've joined us. Today we begin our summer worship with sermons on the Psalms. We hope you'll tune in and enjoy a little bit briefer service of sermon and song. Thank you to our worship leaders and all those who have helped to lead worship these past months. Thanks also to everyone who has joined our partner church Gethsemane Lutheran in Minneapolis, supplying neighbors with critical supplies. We'll continue to stand with our neighbors here and around the world and working toward a better place for all. Please do remember us with your offerings. Summer months is a challenge for us because people are away on adventures and don't always have Mount Calvary on their radar. So please go online and help keep your church a priority. begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all things that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. The writer of that eighth psalm marvels at an incredible truth. Looking up one starry and moonlit evening, the composer is overwhelmed by the immensity, the beauty, the power of what God has created and reflects. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, O oh Lord, what are human beings that you even care about us, that you would even bother to notice, observe, be a part of our days? How is it, O oh Lord, that you have given us this place of honor and glory in your vast universe and made us in your image? The God who creates our beginnings and endings works to guide and help shape every moment between. That God is an awesome God whose majesty and love can scarcely be fathomed, only received and praised, shared and thanked. I love to imagine reading this psalm sitting next to a fire on the shores of Lake Superior on a clear evening when the stars and the planets are visible and the occasional satellite arcs across the sky. I can imagine it read in the deep bass voice of a James Earl Jones or in the bedtime story voice of a mother tucking in a child. I hear then the words inviting me to trust that there's an order to life's madness, to rest assured that God's intentions are for good, not for harm, and that when I wake into a new day or into a new week of life that there will be light for my path and solid ground underfoot. This psalm was meant to be read with awe and wonder, written to be heard with heart and soul, I think written to be sung out loud. 
people of God, life is good. And we need to remember that this day, most days. We need to hold on to that when the very act of living also shows us that life is hard. Life is sad sometimes. Life is painful sometimes. And life certainly doesn't always feel good. Now, for us to say life is good is not to discount the difficulty and the pain that's also there, but to see life as God sees it, God intends it to be. To see through or beyond or despite whatever distorts or destroys life to what God created and is yet to create anew. And finally, to reorient ourselves, to take that leap of faith, calling us to look deep enough into ourselves, deep enough into each other to see the goodness that God makes to look out far enough to see the good God wants us to create alongside each other in the spirit of Jesus. You maybe noticed that the words of Psalm 8 are an echo of the creation story in Genesis 1. Lyrics to a song about a God who can create out of nothing, bring order out of chaos, put firm ground beneath our feet. A God who creates human life to be so invested with meaning and purpose, each and every one, each and every one bearing the image of God's own self, each and every one given responsibility and authority to act on God's behalf, caring for that which and those whom God has made. There's a word in the psalm describing that relationship that we have with creation. It's a word we've struggled with. The word is dominion. Psalmist says, O Lord our God, you have made humanity little lower than you, crowned us with glory and honor, given us dominion over the works of your hands. Dominion, power, authority, responsibility. Now that word at times has been morphed into domination. The belief that God granted us permission to use creation at our own discretion, regardless of the consequences. Dominion implies a belief that God has granted us authority for men to dominate women, for whites to dominate people of color, straights to decide what rights and dignity are to be accorded gays, people in leadership roles to use and manipulate people and resources for their own purpose. That's domination. In his book, American Nations, a look at what he describes as the 11 regional cultures that make up North America, Colin Woodard notes that when the Spanish began colonizing the Americas in the 1500s, Pope Alexander VI gave them ownership of almost the entire Western Hemisphere with one command. He ordered them to convert all of the inhabitants to Catholicism. Whole cultures were destroyed. Whole cultures absorbed so that by 1630, the population of the Americas had dropped 80 to 90 percent because of the diseases and the wars introduced by the Spaniards. When the British settled on the eastern coast, native populations were seen to be an impediment to growth, to be pushed back, to be put to work as servants in the fields and forests, while the settlers had visions of a British-like aristocracy in the Americas, complete with manor houses and large estates. When the supply of labor from the streets of London for raising tobacco and other crops grew to be inadequate, slaves were purchased and imported from Barbados to work the fields. Now the advantage to the Virginia Company and other corporations was that with slaves, unlike indentured servants imported from Europe, they could never pay off their debt, never had the opportunity one day to walk away free. When you bought the slave, you owned them. You owned their children and their children's children forever. The goal again and again was to establish dominion through domination. Systems were put in place to preserve that power and wealth, achieved through dominating the vulnerable, the less powerful, anyone deemed less of value than your country of origin, religion, or race. Now in these days, when some of those systems and others still cast a shadow and more than a shadow, still threaten and diminish some of our sisters and brothers, when we are face to face with the murders in recent days of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the memories of so many others before them, what does it sound like to contemplate the majesty, the awe, and the wonder of God's creation? 
I think it's harder because our eyes are focused not on the heavens, but on the streets, on the deaths, on the divisions between us. In these days, we need to lift up the inclusivity of the psalmist who said, what are human beings that God is mindful of us? Who are we when we are not? What are mere mortals that, that God cares for us? And who are we when we do not? And the psalmist says, you have made us all to be royalty, crowning us with glory and honor. Not just certain ones of us, not just some, but all humanity. And when we allow, perpetuate, or are silent about systems and values that steal or deny that glory and honor from another, we're polluting the majesty of God's good creation. We are defacing and looting people and cultures of their God-inscribed value and dignity. And frankly, through the centuries, too few of us have shown up to clear the debris and stand alongside to rebuild. What we're hearing in recent days, it's time, people, to stand alongside, to listen before speaking, to examine and study. Now, for me, that's to acknowledge my own white identity learned and given. To admit that my white fragility has led, my to, free, led to my frequent silence. And to correctly label and call out attitudes of white supremacy, overt or covert, as a demonic perversion of God's creation. I need to understand how I have been complicit, how I have not accepted my accountability and responsibility. It is the least, and I do mean the very least, that I can do to affirm that people of color do matter. The words about creation in Genesis and, and probably in Psalm 8 are written and shaped by worship leaders, writing them while God's people are captive, exiled, defeated, far from home. They're in a reality they don't even recognize anymore. And these are beautiful, simple, reassuring reminders that when the world is chaotic around us, it's not the first or final answer. Life is still good. It's about a mindful God whom Jesus would describe as knowing when even a sparrow falls. For these initial audiences at a time when they were wrestling with uncertainty in life, a future that seemed bleak and maybe even empty of hope, to hear these words was to be reminded of the one they could look to, the one they could trust to help create a new future. For the first and early audiences of these stories in Psalm 8 and Genesis 1, the shadows of night were times to be afraid, times that they believed evil and malevolent spirits were afoot. And it was dawn's first light, it was the light and dependability of moon and stars that brought sighs of relief and feelings of anticipation. God has indeed led us, brought us through another day, another voyage to live. So what does it mean for us to be good stewards of life, good stewards of creation? What does it look like for us to be using our power and dominion in ways that honor and reflect God's greater will? How in these days when there is such immense grief, fear, sadness, over violent events, how do we best lift up the heart and the teachings of Jesus? What does it look like for us to heed Paul's advice and find common cause with one another, listening for the voice of God, seeking to live in peace? It will be a better day when we do more than just trust God with the beginnings and endings of life, but instead seek his will for all of the days, all of the events between. Here's what I think Psalm 8 wants us to hear. Life is good. Life is beautiful. God saw the world that he'd made and he said, this is great. This is good. He pleads with us to look at the world even now and see the goodness that has been there since the beginning. The goodness that Jesus restores. Good doesn't mean perfect. Good doesn't mean needs no further development or change. Good doesn't refer to a feeling or a status achieved. Good refers to a status gifted, able to be restored, nurtured, embedded in you and in all people, a status shared with all. 
The creation story proclaims that God works in chaos to bring order. That God creates new life to work with what is, and sometimes with what is not, to create what can be. We need to be part of that work. Dominion is not domination. We've been entrusted and called to care for each other, for a creation that belongs to God for the good and all. And we need to be honest about systemic abuses. We need to stop white-splaining the black experience. And because we're made in God's image, we are to ask ourselves if how we live, how we love, reflects God's face, God's heart. And when it doesn't, to ask for forgiveness, to recalibrate again and again. We know from the Bible, from the life of Jesus, that God works with us as we are, where we are, seeking to shape who we will be. Jesus actively works with us to guide and encourage us towards a life filled full and a life given away for the good of all. Life is good. Life is beautiful. We can never ever lose sight of that truth or the responsibility that comes with it. There will be days for you, for us, when chaos returns, when shadows come and the world seems barren of anything that even looks like hope. Maybe in those times, most of all, we need to trust that God is actively birthing love, forgiveness, hope, and compassion. So that when we, like the original audiences of the creation story in Psalm 8, find ourselves living in some form of exile, far from home, far from hope, far from the life we thought it would be, a prisoner to a life that we don't want or choose, that we remember the creator of the universe is not done. God still creating, God's spirit still moving the needle of hope. God deeply desiring to put a new song on the lips and in the hearts of every single child of God. Every child of God. Amen.
colors of the rainbow So pretty in the sky And also on the faces Of all the people going by I see friends shaking hands Saying how do you do Babies cry I watch them grow Then no much more mm -hmm. Than I'll ever know I think to myself Thank you for tuning in to Mount Calvary Digital. We're glad you're here. If you'd like to access our children's Bible stories, click here. If you'd like to check out some previous Fireside Sermons, click here. And if you're interested in subscribing to our YouTube channel, click here. And if you're interested in any of the other content we have on Mount Calvary Digital, click on the links below. <laughs>